Welcome back to Coach Mac's bucket list trip, and we had a great time in Rome. If you didn't get to see everything that Coach got to do in Rome, check that out. We'll have a link at the end of the video so you don't have to miss a thing. And we didn't want to miss a thing either, and I know he wanted to get down to Pompeii and Herculaneum in a hurry. And so we headed down to Sorrento, which is one of my favorite places, and one of the places where you can step off and really get to see the rest of the area. Being a history teacher for 20 some years and, and teaching about Pompeii and teaching about Rome and the things in Greece and Egypt and Mesopotamia. And this was probably the most accessible uh, place to come to see multi, multi items. Rome from the early Roman era to the 16th century, the medieval period and then now back down to, you know, 79 CE uh, here at Pompeii in, in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius. Uh, it's just, it's just out, unbelievable. And to see the things that I'm seeing and the things that I can put my hand on that are 2,000 plus years old and to walk the streets that they walked 2,000 years ago and to touch the walls that they touched, that's, that's uh, that's quite something, and it's, yeah. it's very very humbling, especially for an old history teacher like me. One of my favorite places to stay in all of Italy is Sorrento because it's so close to so many things. And this time we actually stayed in this spectacular villa on a hill overlooking the Bay of Naples and Mount Vesuvius. Ironically, today we're going to visit Pompeii and Herculaneum whose fate was recorded by a dude named Pliny the Younger back in August 24th of 79 CE. And all the artist renditions of it have him like right here where we're staying. And we're in a 1780s villa with these views. The views are just amazing. And we're staying in an olive grove and there's farms everywhere. And the best part of it is really this view. And if for some reason Vesuvius decided to pop off while we were there, we would have been there to see all of the fireworks ourselves. Beautiful. I understand why long ago people lived in the Pompeii Herculaneum area because they didn't really understand the volcanoes or more accurately how damaging it would be. But I mean, there's been a couple of eruptions since then and people still live in that area. Well, many people will ask the same question. Why move back to an area when you know there's a volcano there? Back in the day, there was 20,000 people in this area, and that seemed like a lot. It was a very touristy area, almost like a tourist trap. But the wealthy would come over and they'd take advantage of all of the services, but also of the climate. The climate is really nice here. You get the wind off of the bay, and you have this nice tropical water to jump in. So you can really see why it was such a draw even before you get into the sites but now 
There's like three million people staying here, so if Vesuvius decided to pop off today without any real warning, you can't imagine what chaos that would cause. However, when you do actually make it to these sites, you are blown away and you can really understand why it was so high on Bear and I's bucket list and even higher on Coach's list. This was one of the things he was most looking forward to in life. And it's because it sealed it in like a time capsule, especially Herculaneum. Pompeii is very preserved, but Herculaneum is astonishingly preserved. The events of August 24th, 79 CE must have been like hell on earth. It was recorded, like I said, by a young man named Pliny the Younger, whose father, Pliny the Elder, actually was trying to rescue a lot of people because the first signs of real trouble came with this large ash plume that shot up into the sky. And Pliny said it looked like an umbrella pine. And if you've ever been to Italy, you see the umbrella pines everywhere. They're absolutely beautiful. And it's really descriptive of the way that a stratovolcano volcano will pop straight up in the air and then spread out and it was this spread that really started to cause concern for the people in Pompeii and Herculaneum because as it spread the sky gets dark and you get this light drizzle of ash coming down upon seeing this cloud of ash in the sky darkening many of Pompeii and Herculaneum's inhabitants decided that they were going to head for the hills literally or at least get out to sea and so people would load up on the boats and some would run over to where we're probably staying but the smart ones got out of there however some of them decided to stay thinking that the structures would hold up and that they would be saved by that uh, and that turns out to be a really really bad decision as the morning wanes on the ash starts to fall from the sky even more and more and more as a matter of fact at one point it was coming down at roughly six inches per hour in Pompeii and in Herculaneum being much closer it was coming down even harder and faster than that. Then they start to be pumice stones falling down and lava rocks start falling down and the people who try to go out to escape are going to be pummeled in the head and you see all these skulls in the area with big cracks in their skull from either that or some of them were inside the building buildings as this rock and pumice builds up on the roofs and they collapse down upon them. So it's terrifying and there's people screaming and yelling and it's getting hotter and hotter and more ash. And a few people actually did make it out. They made makeshift helmets out of pillows that they tied with napkins to their head and Pliny the Younger actually documents this as well but while he's standing over there watching all this happens he writes down a really chilling thing he says that many imagined there were no gods left and that the universe was plunged into eternal darkness forevermore and I can imagine kind of how that would happen because you're sitting in this small bay and you have mountains all around you you can't tell whether this is raining down from some other portion of the world and that you're just the last people on earth or if this is like it was a more isolated incident either way this was going to be the end of the world for at least 2,000 people who ended up frozen in time for us to go back and see these days, some of them in skeletal form and some of them as little pockets in the lava that have been filled with plaster by archeologists, which is really surreal and amazing. But for today, what I wanna do is, we're going to go to Pompeii and Herculaneum with Coach, and he and I are gonna walk you through some of the differences and some of the things that make this amazing site bucket list worthy and some of the things that you're gonna to wanna to see and know for your trip there. I can just imagine the fear the people of Pompeii had when that first explosion and they were running pretty much knowing they were dying. There was no, no escaping. I would have hoped to be the guy that had to leave the day before 
to go to Rome on business. And, but, uh, I mean, just looking, and you can imagine them running through the streets in Terra. Women hugging their babies. We just saw an infant that had been preserved in ash, and he was no more than three feet long. And just, yeah. And then the figure of a man that's squatting, he's got his hand over his nose, trying to protect himself from the heat and the ash. And of course, he didn't make it. So I know that uh, Coach and you talk about the tragedy, and I think that was probably one of the most impactful parts of visiting Pompeii and Herculaneum. But luckily there was still a lot of cool parts about it, and we were able to learn a lot more that was a lot less grim. Pompeii is some of the absolute best ancient ruins in the world. I mean, uncovered, the story of this Mount Vesuvius, it's just unbelievable gives you one hell of a good look back and uh, you can imagine how they lived and how they worked you know who the rich were you know who the poor were we're in a house right now that's two stories and it's just unbelievable i loved watching coach's face when he was seeing all these things for the first time and i'm glad we went to pompeii first because he was impressed by that second story of the building. There's really not very many of them there, and our next stop has a bunch of them. But one thing that Pompeii has is it's really spread out. You can really tell that it was a town that a lot of people lived in, and that a lot of them actually lived there all the time instead of just being a tourist trap like Herculaneum kind of felt like. Right. But uh, there's all these olive groves, mm -hmm. and they've got it amphitheater and they've got an agora and they've got just all the things that a traditional Roman society would have yeah. and then of course they had a lot of grape vines. Oh yeah of course they had a lot of grapes because they had to make their wine and Italians love their wine. Oh probably vino. sweet red wine like the vino. Coach likes. Mmm. Abadanza vino. One of my favorite parts about Pompeii was all the road systems. Um, and a lot of them had these big, like, boulder things in the middle of the road. And uh, didn't you say Coach uh, taught you something about those? Yeah, I always love it when I get taught something about something that I didn't know beforehand. This is a prime example. Roman carriages were made off of the width of two horses' asses. All vehicles in Rome, chariots as well as cargo, had the same axle width, same wheels, and they had they were all interchangeable parts. This was designed to where the cart wheels would roll on the outside and the horses would step over. And it was designed so that you could go from one sidewalk to the other sidewalk without stepping down and the street which more than likely had some water and sewage. Uh, back in the day, but that's, that's the whole design. And the oddity of it is, standard gauge of the railroad is based off the same width of the two horses' asses that the Romans used originally. Another thing that they had there were gladiator games, and so they had their own little small version of a coliseum. And then one of the best preserved areas or restored areas is where all the gladiators would train and it really shows their place in the world and in the Roman society as a whole. This is a practice field, coach. Huh? This is a practice field. Yeah. You gotta make the call. <laughs> what happens if they don't show up at practice, coach? They don't play. The other thing about Pompeii that fascinated me was the gladiator quarters and the gladiator training ground was pristine. It was like they were just used yesterday. The, uh, the cubicles where they were housed, the grass where they practiced, the hallways, it was just like it was built three weeks ago. And I was really fascinated by that. That was one of the last things we saw when we were leaving. And I actually spent uh, some extra time there looking. As much as I really like Pompeii, there's such a difference in the way that the things were preserved and in the way that they were actually dug. And a lot of this has to do with its placement on the volcano. And so Pompeii, they get 
a long barrage of slow ash falling down. Right. And then eventually, after a bunch of people have run away and some have gone and hid in their houses, they get the pyroclastic flow that comes through and just kind of finishes it all off. Whereas Herculaneum, they are on a different side of the mountain. And so the wind is blowing towards Pompeii. Right. and not towards Herculaneum. So Herculaneum has this whole time while it's first blowing up and while the cloud is spreading out and most of the people in Herculaneum, they get out of here. Right. Plus they're like right on the water. So yeah. they're able to get on some of the boats. Maybe Pliny the Elder actually got there and was able to play coasty or something and pull them all off to the side. Um, but there weren't as many people left in there which was good because it became like hell on earth because the pyroclastic flow that happened when a stratovolcano blows its top right the top drops back down and it just explodes this mass of heat and smoke and ash and the directionality of that pyroclastic flow was primarily right at herculaneum and so herculaneum takes the mass of that ash and so instead of like maybe six meters of ash right you've got like maybe 45 meters of ash and this has led to that preservation that i know you love because the top wasn't there for the romans to sack and to right. steal things from and nobody even really knew it was there after a little while because it's like three stories deep of ash yep and I think that that was really kind of what preserved Herculaneum the most. And I know the preservation was something that was really evident to both of us when we got together. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, let me say, um, speaking of the preservation, one of the things I noticed was the human remains were preserved differently. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So in Herculaneum, there weren't nearly as many because like you said, many of them escaped, but the, the bodies that were found there were skeletons, whereas in Pompeii, they were all trapped in their houses. Um, so they, they couldn't escape, and so they were just kind of frozen in time. Yeah, and it's and, cool. Uh, the archaeologists really who found them frozen in time, they were just like pockets of space with some bones in it, right? So we filled it with stucco. So those aren't actually what was there. That's them filled with stucco. And the skeletons, the skeletons are mostly in the boathouse. And right when we were there, that was open and you could see it. Right. When we, as in Coach and Lindsay and I were there, they had that closed off because they were digging further along down into where the water was. Yeah. And they found another skeleton. And this one wasn't, I guess we could call it lucky enough to be hiding inside and burned to death. That's probably not very lucky. <laughs> but he got blown out by the pyroclastic flow. Wow. Like, 30 feet through the air and maybe slammed into a boat or something yeah. but he hit whatever he hit so hard that blood seeped into his bones it was pressured into his bones and they found blood in his bones that's amazing um i will say that he was probably the lucky one i would rather uh, die no, from, uh, from impacts than uh, being burned alive personally but i think <laughs> it was supposed to be like thousands of degrees like it yeah. burnt the skin off your yeah, flesh yeah it so would be pretty fast either way it was probably true. pretty fast and yeah. if you're gonna go yeah. Go big or go home, right? Speaking of the preservation of the buildings, I think that's probably what made Herculaneum my favorite, right? You could see a lot more of the art. Um, as you mentioned, there were actually two-story buildings, whereas Pompeii, there's like one. Um, and that was really awesome, and that had to do with you know, being covered in ash instead of being wiped out right away by big rocks and lava and everything. I think that's kind of crazy that they even found Herculaneum because you, when you walk down through those tunnels of ash down, 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 right. down, down to get to the boathouse, it's almost like forever it feels like and you're so deep down in there and apparently some architect was just digging to do a foundation or something and stumbled across it much later than they had stumbled across it in Pompeii. Right. In fact, there's a really cool story about the first time Pompeii was discovered and then it was covered back up. Oh yeah? Because this guy was digging in Pompeii underneath the first layer and apparently came down into a broad with lots of uh, let's just call them interesting paintings and he was very religious and he's like oh I gotta clear this all back up so nobody oh yeah I, I remember that section of the uh, of the archaeological museum yeah. um, I, I could 
I understand uh, where he was coming from. It would be quite a culture shock if yes. you weren't expecting it. If he were in the 1500s, <laughs> yeah. it would have been uh, quite alarming to see those types of artifacts. Absolutely. Fortunately, for those who are a little bit prudish, not all of the art is super crude. And they moved most of the crude art, I think maybe all of it, to the Naples Museum. Like yeah, we I don't remember about. seeing any of it so when we were there. This site is actually pretty family friendly. So is the museum, as long as you don't go into a certain section. And as long as you can handle nude statues, because there were nude statues all over the right. place. And uh, they weren't realistically proportioned either. I think it's funny because you uh, you see Italian art and Greek art and they're like in very small phallic regions. Right. Um, but then you see the art that they uh, retrieved from Pompeii and it is like seven feet long. Yeah, the classic <laughs> artists were much more uh, concerned with things not falling off of their statues right. than uh, trying to exaggerate their manhood. Yeah. But it really is a cool place and you need to go to Naples, but Naples is uh, not nearly as nice as Sorrento, we'll say, but it's right. a great place to get pizza and go to the museum. And you can take a train from Sorrento to anywhere in Naples, including Pompeii and Herculaneum. But getting back to the art. Yeah. All right. This is what separated it for me, at least the art that they drew. Right. And uh, the preservation of the art is ridiculous. This is because it was really like even the top floors, some of the roofs apparently didn't cave in at first. Mm -hmm. And so there's even frescoes and things extending into the second stories in Herculaneum. It's just amazing. And it's so small, the area that you can actually see that they've gotten to spend a whole lot of time actually making it look nicer. But early on, when people would go and visit there, they would make their own art. And I know this was very frustrating to you, just like it was very frustrating to me. So tell these people about making their own art, Brendan. Guys, this art is so old and it's already amazing. Even if you're an artist, you don't need to go and add to it by carving your name or, or carving phallics uh, into the side of the building. Penis. Penis. Um, yeah, Lots penises. of penises. Yeah, and a lot of carved penises. So I guess I can take back what we said before, not seeing any uh, penis art. Uh, we didn't see any penis art from the actual Herculaneums. So maybe the People hooligans were just trying to bring it back. Though. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were really just oh, trying yeah. to do good. No, they weren't. No, no, they weren't. Don't watched, do that. If you watched the Don't Rome episode, to you. <laughs> and if you didn't watch it, go back and find out what that meant back then. All right, but... Uh, it wasn't all about art. I know there was something there that really caught your attention. And it caught Coach's attention too. The shops were very interesting, and you could tell by their design. And as one tour guide told me when I pointed out to a shop that had uh, six cook ovens, she said, McDonald's, McDonald's, saying that it was the McDonald's of the day. And then I walked up the street a little while, and there was another one, and I hollered back at her, Burger King, Burger King. And she went, ah, yes, Burger King. And Coach makes a great point. Um, there were all those little tiny kitchen things. I think they call them thermopoliums. Pizza. Um, and that was, uh, there was like a whole section of it. And it was kind of like ingrained in their culture that they would go out and they would go out to these street food, essentially, these street food places and go and get their bread, which is really important. Um, and uh, you know, they had some that made pizza and um, they had like like meat and all these different things and there wasn't a whole lot of kitchens like in people's houses. Right, they just had to go to the food court in the morning. Right, I mean, I think that's really cool. And speaking of the bread, archeologists actually found like, like bread that was still in the oven. So it's like people were making the bread or the, the restaurant uh, people were making their bread and then the, uh, the eruption comes and everybody starts running away and they just leave their bread in the oven. And that's just amazing that it was so preserved that the archeologists were actually able to find that bread. Right, and it belonged to a slave who was probably making it for someone else. Right. And then he put his own mark on it. So I don't know whether it was in their own oven right. or if they just brought their dough and put a little stamp on it and threw it in the oven, which would be interesting. If anybody knows about that, let me know on the bottom. Yeah. But the bread is really cool, and it's surprising that it didn't get burnt. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and 
I thought it was also cool that there was a lot of signage. Uh, me being a uh, advertising major, I think that's really cool that there were actual like like signs on their restaurants. Right, you could pick out what you wanted right. by what the painting was, and uh, that was really amazing to see in person. This was a little taberna, and they would serve their wine or whatever libations that they had, and uh, then they would have pictures of what they served over here, and you can kind of see her with the big jug, but uh, to say the big jugs, she was with a big jug here, um, and uh, probably had wine in it or something. And then I'm gonna have to hypothesize that this is a tail right here, and probably a cow looking down at the hooves. And uh, I'd assume you can get a steak here. So uh, we had a little grill back here. Um, they don't really give us access to very many of the things, but they would have cooked back in this little area, maybe stored some food, and uh, served it all here and scooped out some libations and everybody has a good old time. And so these thermopoliums, they actually had, you know, like serving dishes. They had like plates and luckily they had running water so they were able to uh, clean it. Um, and speaking of running water, the archeologists were actually able to look into their pipe system and they found all these, all these little food scraps. So they were able to kind of get an idea of what they ate, right? And a lot of it was, you know, local stuff like uh, figs and local fish and, and grapes and wine and, and olives, right? Um, but some of it Did was- you say olives? I hate olives. <laughs> I hate olives too, oh. but, but the, uh, the Italians, they, they like some olives. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, definitely found some olives in there. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was that there were some things that was not from there. They had to import it, right? Um, they found like sea urchin and like flamingo, and they even found part of like a giraffe like joint bone. How does that even get down there without <laughs> it clogging the pipes? It's I don't know. Like, like, they had like liquid plumber at the time. So how do you get your <laughs> giraffe knuckle out of your pipe? And how does it get there in the first place? You'd think if, if you're gonna have running water, you learned how to have a strainer. Right. Right? And so put a strainer on it, you can yeah. keep the giraffe knuckles out of your water. You probably would have to rerun the pipes after. Yeah, they thing. probably they probably had to flush the system. You could see them everywhere. They would run down inside the walls mm -hmm. and they would run down along the sidewalks. And we got some good footage of that that you can see here. And uh, the other thing that was really cool with them finding all the food that was down there is they could reconstruct their diet. And the reason that was really important is like you couldn't find a single cavity in Herculaneum, even wow. all the slaves. They were eating that Mediterranean diet, which probably would have helped them to live a really long time apparently and have a blue zone or whatever. But uh, it also is really good for their teeth. So they all had really good teeth. And I thought that was really cool. And uh, that would be good because if you have to go to the restroom or to the bath, you better have a good smile because you ain't got nothing else on right next to everybody in the community. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> the other fascinating thing was the public toilets and the baths. The baths were beautiful. And everybody shared, rich, poor, slave. Uh, they all shared the baths. They all shared the public toilets. Uh, you'd go on a public toilet, you could be sitting next to a 10-year-old on one side and a 32-year-old lady on the next. Uh, so uh, the use of the facilities was uh, just everyday commonplace. And that was kind of fascinating. But the decorations in some of the baths were very elaborate. And they had hot baths and you could get out and go next in a cold bath. Get up out of the cold bath, go back into the hot bath. Uh, but everybody were uh, everybody was encouraged to use the baths, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, just finished doing uh, the whole city of Herculaneum. Uh, very very impressive. Uh, I agree with Lindsay. I, it, it appears to be better built than did Pompeii. But the most interesting artifact was a small statue of a guy with a big belly, uh, presumably drunk, with a jug of wine, and he's leaning back, and he's got his hand on his pee-pee, and he's 
pissing. <laughs> and I thought that was absolutely funny. That statue was absolutely hilarious. Do you remember that statue? Oh yeah, I do. It reminds me of so many stances of people after they've drank too much. And it was, <laughs> it was actually one of our best Instagram hits. I think we got like a thousand two hundred hits on just this picture of a stone guy stoned on life and being and uh, it was a really amazing piece of art and really if it wasn't for my experience back when we went at Pompeii it would have meant that Herculaneum just blew Pompeii out of the water right but sometimes as an archaeologist you do have really amazing opportunities so three years ago when I was here, uh, I was really lucky. The nice thing about being an archaeologist, even just with a master's degree, is that you could drop the right names. And so I'm sitting here on the other side of the fence like everybody else is, and there's a field school, and they're actually, they were unearthing this floor surface that you see right here. And as they were unearthing the floor surface, I was talking to them about archaeology and about Maya archaeology and all the things that I kind of know and the people that I know in that and the guy who was running it came over and he said come on over so i got to come over and probably just about three or four yards that way they had found a broken pot and they were sitting there and they were feathering it out with their paint brushes just trying to get the little dust out not damage anything it wasn't that uh, discerning of a piece of uh, pottery shirt but it still was a piece of pottery shirt from that floor right there and i got to help them unearth it and it's probably in some museum collection right now not that it's probably taking up anything of a prestigious point but it's a hell of a really cool view to sit here and dig especially for somebody who's used to digging in a jungle um, so that was one of my things and uh, we need more people to study archaeology so go study archaeology learn the right names to drop and then maybe you get like backstage passes and you get to go into tunnels that nobody goes to and all these things or you could just follow me around on YouTube and I will uh, find them for you. So uh, there you go. Shameless plug, follow, like, and uh, we'll do a whole lot more fun stuff together. And some of it will be little archaeology. That'll be cool. Cheers. And remember to find yourself on the journey.